What is up guys, Wrestling Premier is here. Random upload, huh? Well, I decided from here on I'm gonna start covering NXT and AEW pay-per-views. I thought this was a great time to start. You know, this card, I thought it was cool. And I'm seriously considering whether or not to do those special AEW events, you know, like uh, Winter is Coming, Beach Break, you know, all special episodes. I'm seriously considering doing those also, but yes. I'm now on NXT and AEW pay-per-views. Uh, I was actually gonna do the Rumble uh, two weeks earlier, but then I got sick in a couple of things, but yeah. From here on, you can expect me to cover AEW and uh, NXT Bay reviews. The next video is two days from now, so yeah. This event was wild. I honestly didn't expect it to be one of the best NXT takeovers ever, but it actually is. Like, if the crowd was there, I think it'd be top three, probably. It's just that damn good. The matches, they all delivered, and then some. There was a shocker in the end. There was a new signee, that being Eli Drake. They called him LA Knight or something like that. Like, what the hell is that name? Anyways, so let's just get into it. NXT TakeOver Vengeance Day. The first match was the finals for the Women's Dusty Classic. Winner gets a shot at Baszler and Nia Jax for the tag titles. Raquel Gonzalez and Dakota Kai meet Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart. Okay, this match blew me away. It was so ridiculous in a good way that it set the pace for what would be one of the best damn takeovers in my eyes. I gotta say right now, like, I haven't been watching NXT recently that much. As a matter of fact, the only two matches I watched were Finn Balor versus Kyle O'Reilly, both their uh, matches. Other than that, I just haven't been watching it recently. Initially, Moon and Blackheart struggled to isolate Gonzalez. It was impossible to phase her in the very beginning, and so the underdogs went after Dakota Kai instead. They were very intelligent in targeting her previously injured knee. Kai was shouting in pain, reaching for help, but there was nothing she could do, and you'd think they were the heels by the looks of it because they were basically isolating her and cutting off the ring like a normal heel tag team would do. But it was different this time around. Once Gonzalez entered the ring, oh man, she picked up the pace with clubbing blows to Ember Moon, causing destruction by throwing those two around, especially Blackheart. She rammed her body right into the plexiglass, and in the ring, Ember Moon was isolated for a bit, but she found an opening and nearly scored the victory. But it wasn't to be because Kai was smart enough to distract the ref. Blackheart's in once again, a couple of near falls. Hell, she even had a sliced bread. There was a suicide dive from her. They were all over Gonzalez, but she was essentially indestructible. Then on the outside, they hit a double team on Kai. Some crazy stuff. Back and forth action leading to Ember Moon getting thrown to the outside and off the stage. Double team from Gonzalez and Kai and power bomb. That's all she wrote, man. That was fun. It was fast, rough, all of that. Gonzalez, she's definitely going places. For sure, it was an easy watch, very good match that I thoroughly enjoyed. There were some hiccups there, but for the most part, it was good, and it was definitely an awesome way to open up the show. I do hope those two become tag champions, you know? It'd be cool to see an NXT team hoist the titles, but I highly doubt they're gonna do it. Then again, who knows? The next match is for the NXT North American Championship. Johnny Gargano defends the gold against Kushida. If you had asked me before the match, hey, who's winning? I would have guessed Kushida for sure. The way the story was built up beforehand, you know, Johnny's buddy Austin Theory being kidnapped or whatever, it made it seem like he was heavily reliant on them and he was gonna lose. He sent his wife in Hartwell to search for Theory, so Gargano was all alone. I haven't seen much of Hill Gargano, but man, is he annoying. In the beginning, hell, middle, and end of the match, both men kept up with each other. They were very competitive. Kushida was very persistent in going after that arm, but Gargano was very well aware of his plan. Some man wrestling early on, front face lock, cross face position. There was this moment where both men countered damn near everything. But following this, Kushida managed to damage the arm of Gargano on the outside. Sure, it didn't count, you know, he couldn't get the victory there, but the work was being done. Gargano had to learn how to be independent once again and to make matters worse, he had to wrestle with a non-dominant arm. But at this point in time, it was no problem. Why? Because he learned to adapt. Kushida, on the other hand, was still in it and he wasn't exactly missing a step. They were both still countering each other's moves at such a fast pace. And at this point, things were kicking up a notch. Gargano's arm was rammed into the post and it wasn't like he was completely out of it because he hit a damn twisted superplex. Then, they continuously counter each other's holds once again, trying to outmaneuver the other and they were thinking the same exact things, you know, clothesline, right hand. Both men were doing the same exact thing. Once they recovered, Johnny managed to lock Kushida in the Gargano escape, but unfortunately for himself, he didn't have 100% strength, and so Kushida locked in a hold of his own. Both guys were going all out for that title, meant to top it all off, Kushida cut Gargano's arm in midair. At this point, I legit thought it was it, like that moment just had the feeling to it like you knew there was going to be a new champion. But Johnny actually managed to reach the rope, he was stuck in the hold on the outside, and to make matters worse, Kushida kicked his arm, locked him in the hoverboard lock once again. But positivity would finally come his way when he hit one final beat on the outside. This knocked out Kushida a bit, and so Johnny hit another one on the inside to win the match. Wow, they definitely delivered. I mean, everyone expected this match to be awesome, and it was. They solved the arm injuries. Gargano made me believe he was losing. It was thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly entertaining. You know, they tried to keep up with one another and all that. Yeah, I, I loved it. It was awesome. 
It wasn't my favorite match of the night. Cool stuff, though. Probably one of the very best matches of the year so far. The next matchup was the final for the Dusty Rhodes Classic. MSK goes up against the Grizzled Young Vets. So I already said I haven't watched much of NXT recently, and I guess I've been missing out. These damn guys, you know MSK, they're impressive. They were better known as the Rascals, and right when they signed with WWE, they gave him this big-ass push-down in NXT. Anyways, in the beginning, nice exchanges from Gibson and Carter. MSK showed teamwork and spear in the early going. They utilized the momentum to the best of their abilities initially, but unfortunately, though, Zach Gibson lived up to the name of Vet. He cut Carter off guard, and they were back into it. The duel started to isolate Carter, and they were oozing experience, you know, tagging in and out, refusing to let Nash even breathe, distracting the ref, and Wesley was starting to lose patience, but what was there to do? Once Carter found that opening, though, he was in. Very aggressive on the offense, Lee was diving over the top turnbuckle, he was doing whatever it takes to win the match. MSK worked as a team for the first time in a while, and Carter, despite the pain, was all fired up, showing intensity, and it took a bit for the young vets to take back control. They hit their double team once again, I thought it was it, but it wasn't. MSK recovered and threw everything at the Young Vets, but still not enough. And things got worse for the team when the Young Vets had a suicide doomsday device. Wow. Back to isolation. Carter was left in there with Drake and Gibson, but he refused to let go of that dream. In that moment itself, once again, I thought they lost. Ticket to Mayhem wasn't to be because Wesley was back in. Neckbreaker, powerbomb, or power slam. That's all she wrote. Damn. Some incredible action once again, they fooled me, you know, I only learned what was up with the tournament from the build and they made it seem like MSK's dream was going to be dashed, but that clearly, clearly, clearly wasn't the case. They're being pushed to the moon at the moment, and with the victory, who knows, they might even win the NXT tag titles. Another great match to make it 3 for 3, cool moves, awesome action, everything was great with this one once again. Meanwhile, they showed Cameron Grimes who was having fun spending cash and it gave me DDP WCW vibes. The next match was for the NXT Women's Championship. Mercedes Martinez and Tony Storm challenged Io Shirai. Okay, once again, I already said it. I haven't watched much of NXT recently, but Io Shirai, she's a star to watch, of course. I always hear a lot about her. As for Tony Storm, it looks like they're gonna give her the title eventually. She just has a feeling to it, but yes. Anyways, right out of the gate, Martinez attacked. Shirai was pretty fun in the beginning. Champ misses a moonsault and is thrown out of the equation. They went at it for a few seconds before Shirai's back in. She didn't make much of an impact during this part of the match. As a matter of fact, nobody had the outright advantage. There was this spot that was 619s, drop kicks, Germans off the top rope, a bunch of stuff was going down. Fun. They killed each other on the outside and nobody really benefited. Storm was preparing for some sort of table spot, but it just broke like that. Found that hilarious. She ended up taking a DDT and since Shirai likes jumping off stuff, she did just that. And to make matters worse for herself, she was tossed into the steps. So this left Martinez and Storm in the ring. Mercedes hit four knees in the face with Tony Storm. Hit the Fisherman Buster, but it wasn't enough. Storm recovered though and hit Storm Zero that was kicked out of. And I'm just thinking like, what if there was a crowd? Awesome stuff. Io Shirai then runs in with a moonsault catching both women to retain the title. Good match. All three of them busted their asses. It may have felt a bit short, but very fun. I feel if it went a bit longer, yes, it would have been, been another great, great, great match in this card. But yeah, it's just good. Table spot, it was pretty funny, you know. I loved how Barry explained why the table broke too. Shirai retains the title. I expect her to defend it against Tony Storm in the future. And the main event. Finn Balor defends the NXT Championship against Pete Dunne. Oh man, am I hyped for this. It has the potential to be a match of the year candidate. And am I the only one that would be satisfied with a Finn and Edge match? I mean, I think it would be cool, but they have that story with Romans. I wouldn't be angry if they had that match, you know, Edge coming down to NXT. It'd be cool. Pete Dunne, he's a heel now, apparently. I missed out on a bunch of stuff. Finn, he's the prince. He's no longer the smiley guy. He's the one that whoops ass, and he's essentially a tweener, kind of. He's more of a babyface though, so yeah. Anyways, right out of the gate, they aggressively locked up. Dunn was very clever trying to go after the left arm that Kyle O'Reilly worked on a few weeks back. But Balor though wasn't stupid either. He knew what Dunn was capable of. Nice exchanges from both men, scissors lock, all that. And Dunn was very aggressive with his own shoulder. He knew Finn was thinking about the jaw because of this, Dunn had opportunities to target other body parts. Finn was so worried over the jaw, but despite this, he was good on defense. That is until the bruiser weight bent his arm backwards. This gave P. Dunn the advantage, and he was very remorseless with the attack, and Finn was slowly reaching critical condition. Luckily for the prince, he found his opening by targeting Dunn's left leg, and the challenger wasn't putting any weight on that leg. So Finn was keeping his eye on it. The match then started to pick up with some moves, you know, and Sagiri, clothesline, and suddenly Finn was the aggressor. But at a moment's notice, Dunn easily put a stop to the offense. Some cool back and forth from both men, and it concluded with a sit-down powerbomb from Dunn, but it wasn't enough for the W. They are very persistent in the attack, and every time one of them was on offense, they'd go after the injured arm 
her leg. Finn ended up having a burst of momentum and almost hit the coup de gras, but was caught in a hold, and the hold ended up knocking him out. Luckily for himself, he had reached the ropes, though, so it wasn't the end, and at this point, he was on one arm. Then Dunn delivered a low blow before hitting the bitter end. One, two, no. I thought that was it. I, I really did. It gave me flashbacks to AJ Styles at Backlash 2016. Back to the hand stomps, Finn finds an opening, but this man was unstoppable. Finn hits a side slam, but it's not enough for the W, and it was close. It was really, really, really close. To top it all off, he removes Dunn's mouth guard and smashes his mouth before hitting the coup de gras, and he knew damn well that the bruiser weight was getting up, so he hits the 1916. One, two, three. Damn. Pure insanity going down, and I loved every minute of it. It was just really my favorite match of the night, definitely. Why? Both guys went back and forth, they sold the injuries well, and it felt rough, you know. Dunn was always targeting the fingers and the arm, and Finn was going after that leg, I liked it. And sure, it may have started a bit slow, you know, with the mat wrestling and the technical stuff, but hey, I appreciated it, I thought it was cool. It was a different kind of match. They had this main event, big fight feeling to it, and if the crowd was there once again, they would have reacted very well to it. And yes, that's what I think about this match. I think it was a match of the night. Finn, he's big match Finn. He always delivers on pay-per-view. And for the short run he's had, there was good matches. You know, his match with Kyle O'Reilly were awesome. This one, it didn't disappoint. I loved it. Right after the match, Birch and Larkin make the attack, but Undisputed Era makes the save, and O'Reilly tries to convince Finn to join. By the looks of it, he does, and NXT ends with the Undisputed Era on top. Whoa, whoa, whoa. For some reason, Adam Cole delivered a super kick just like that, and I was like, what? I really wanted to see Finn lead them to the main roster or something, but it just wasn't to be. But they got me with that one, honestly. I really thought Finn was going to be a part of the group, but hey. Adam Cole's like Triple H, he doesn't like playing second fiddle, right? And then Kyle O'Reilly, who actually was the one who recruited Finn, got angry at Cole, who proceeded to super kick him, and so the Undisputed Era is over? Roddy Strong didn't know what to do, and I'm just wondering, like, why, why did they split them up? I really thought they were gonna make it to the main roster as a group and then split up there, but hey, it just wasn't the case. With the Undisputed Era split, it does open up new stories, you know, for Kylo O'Reilly. They're gonna push him well, and this feud with Adam Cole is gonna be cool for sure. Like, regardless, if Cole faces Finn or O'Reilly, it's gonna be great. But yes, Adam Cole broke everybody's heart on Valentine's Day by turning on Kyle O'Reilly. Like I said, they got me with this pay-review. I'm more intrigued to watch NXT more often now. I realize that I missed out on a bunch of stuff, so yeah. Most shocking moment, definitely the Undisputed Era split. Great pay-per-view, one of the best takeovers I've ever watched for certain. Main event, I loved it. It's my favorite match of the night. My least favorite match was uh, the NXT Women's Championship match. That had more to do with, like, the time, I guess? I think that's why it wasn't as good as everyone thought it was. I'm looking forward to the Undisputed Era storyline, so yeah. What'd you guys think of NXT TakeOver Vengeance Day? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit a 1916 on the like button, and perhaps a super kick on the subscribe button. Peace, I'm out.